Let us begin with a, a word of prayer, and we'll dive in. My dear Heavenly Father, I come before you today, and I thank you for your spirit. I thank you for your blessing, and ask that you would uh, teach us your word this today, that you would show us your truth, and thank you, Lord, for Mom, and thank you for your love and your grace, and that abounds and it is free. Lord, teach us your word. Show us your spirit. Be in our presence, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, August 19th, 1992, is the day I'll never forget. Kim and I had been married uh, for over a year. Micah was just a little over two months. She's almost 25 now. (laughs) We were living in Price, and um, where I was serving as an assistant pastor at Price Chapel Church, and I was as green as ever, probably still am. (laughs) And Kim and I had planned to move to New York in January of 93, where I would attend the seminary, and Kim would finish up her college degree. And I was working toward my ordination with the CMA, and, and the ministry I was assigned to help with um, children's ministry, Awana and Youth. And, you know, the church still had its Wednesday night service and its Sunday evening service. And I remember we had gone to the prayer meeting on Wednesday night on August 19th, and after the meeting, Kim and I sorry, drove home to our two-bedroom apartment, and uh, the phone was ringing. And uh, we went and got the phone, and Kim and I were both listening, and it's her dad, her dad Steve. And uh, you could tell something wasn't right, some bad news. And he told us that he had to go, uh, sorry. He had to go check on Kim's mother, Deborah, since she was not responding to phone calls. And he had to break in and found that she had died. She was 42 years old. She went too soon. If you could help me those tissues. Thank you. Uh, this is the picture of her uh, in the blue at our, at our wedding. You know, I wish I could just speak to her one more time. Uh, I wish I could tell her and show her, her our four kids. Fortunately, she did get to see and meet Micah. I wish that I could show her um, her daughter and the wonderful woman that she is. And, but I, I know that she already knew that. I wish I could tell her the wonderful adventures we've had while being married. I just wish I could hear her voice one more time, you know? And just simply say thank you. Thank you for the daughter that you raised. Thank you for the, just the person that you are. And the heart that she had. And, you know, just loving my wife, I just want to honor her as well. And so I praise God for my mother-in-law, Deborah, And I wish that I could just see her one more time, you know? Talk to her one more time. And then as I reflect on my own mom, picture of my mom here, I'm thankful and grateful for the mom that I have, you know. She was born in south central Colorado in a town called Manassas, similar to the tribe of Israel. I don't know if it's spelled the same way. Her parents were not well off. Um, she was, she's, they were Mexican. She spoke Spanish before she spoke English. Her father had several jobs. He was a... Uh, Post, he, he, he delivered the mail, I know that. Well, when my mom was 16, she dropped out of high school. And she went to Denver. And imagine it was quite an eye-opening experience to go from rural Manassas to a big city like Denver, even in the early 40s. In 1945, my father came back from the war, and he asked uh, my mom if she wanted to get married, and she agreed. I think it even went down like that, too. Hey, you want to get married? And she agreed, and they went to the Justice of the Peace, and they married in October of 45. And this year, that will be 72 years. They eventually, they eventually made their home in Price, Utah, where my father taught at the local college, and my mother was a homemaker. My mom and dad, they raised five kids, and I remember how hard working my mother, my mother was, how diligent she was in, in all that she did. 
and how important she made me feel. You know, as a kid, you never really realize how hard your parents work until you leave. And then you go, they did all this? <laughs> I mean, you have your chores and stuff, and you do your chores, but then you realize, they did all this? <laughs> and you're just amazed. <laughs> and I love my mom and, and how, hard, how sweet her heart is. She's now 91 years old. Her body's breaking down. Her health is against her. But she's as strong as they come. She's unable to walk for very long. Her eyesight is poor, and the pain that she endures each, each day is overwhelming. And although she was a high school dropout, she's the wisest woman that I know. I still remember her, you know, don't do something. She'd tell me maybe don't take, like in junior high, she told me not to take a certain class in elective. Of course, you know, I'm going to take it. Or I'd do something that she said not to do, and it, I'd always reap the, the worst of it. And go, I should have just listened to her. <laughs> She was very wise. She knew. She had this sense. This, um, she understood this, uh, and she could see things. And so she's very perceptive and discerning. I'm here to honor my mother, my late mother-in-law, but more importantly, to honor and worship the one who created mom, who came out with the idea of mom, and who gave us mom. I want to worship God today, and I want his presence here among us to bring us healing, to strengthen our faith, and to celebrate with us the importance of knowing him. To know him comes from those who teach us about him. Our parents can be the greatest source of knowledge and discipline in knowing God, or they can be a huge detriment. God told the Israelites in Deuteronomy 6, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. These commandments I give you today are to be upon your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down, when you get up. In the book of Judges, Joshua continues to lead the people. And the people are following God because of Joshua's leadership. But when he dies in chapter 2, this is what we read in Judges 2. After that whole generation had gathered to their fathers, another generation grew up who knew, their ne- who knew neither the Lord nor what he had done for Israel. Why is that? Why did that happen? Because they didn't follow Deuteronomy 6. They didn't go around teaching their kids who God was. The role of mother is very important, very crucial. The role of mother is one of nurture and compassion. It is one of talking about the commands and laws and words of God. It's one of healing and godliness. It's one of hard work and selfless living. It is one who provides a stable home and a foundation for her children. So I want you to know today, the beauty of God's grace is revealed in mom. The beauty of God's grace is revealed in mom. You know, when God created the world... And the universe, he created it by speaking it into being. And you think of God and his power, his creative power. That the words of God have power to bring life and creation. And it's awesome. And the world came into existence by him just speaking. And on the sixth day in Genesis 1, it says this. Let us make man in our image, in our likeness. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female. He created them. God created man and woman, male and female. He created marriage. He created the marriage relationship. He created life and he put his image on them. And the image is known clearly and truly in relationship between a man and a woman. What we see in this passage is that people, male and female, have a relationship with God, with each other, and with the earth. He put them in charge of the earth and gave them dominion over the earth. He wanted them to be like him as they gave leadership over the earth. He wanted them to be like him. It was in their relationship with God and to each other that would demonstrate the relationship to the earth. But primarily it started with God. And in chapter 2 of Genesis, you see how God, how he created man and woman. He took dust and he formed it and then he breathed into his creation and man became a living being. He then put man into a deep sleep, took a rib, and from that rib he formed woman and brought the woman to the man. 
The creation of male and female was meticulous and careful. He did not just speak male and female into existence. He carefully crafted them into the living creatures that they are. He saw the importance of carefully crafting male and female. He saw the importance of mom and dad. He saw the importance of husband and wife. He created that importance and he created that relationship. He created intimacy between husband and wife, mother, father, and children. He created the family. And it is the family, it is a relationship that is attacked, that's hated, and, that, and is destroyed by the enemy. The enemy wants to destroy family, relationships, mom and dad, brother, sister. He wants to attack it. And he wants to tear it apart. He wants to cause division, disunity, discord, bitterness, and malice. He wants hateful words to corrode the minds of kids. And he wants brokenness and anger to grow. That's what the enemy wants. And so the enemy attacks the family. He attacks marriages and he attacks moms and dads. Your family, your life is under spiritual attack. And that's why we must pray each day for our families. For each other. The beauty of God's grace is revealed when mom loves God. When mom seeks God and when mom lives according to the calling of God. You can see the beauty and wonder of God through mom. So today I want to examine through scripture moms. I want to paint a picture of how they reveal God's grace. And we're not talking about a perfect mom. We're talking about a priority mom. And a priority mom is someone who puts God first. A priority dad is someone who puts God first. This is not about perfection. We want priority marriages, priority families, and priority lives where God is put first. So number one in 1 Samuel 1 and 2, a mother prays. A mother prays. When you think of a pray mother, I think of Hannah. Hannah means grace. Hannah was married to a guy named Elkanah. And Elkanah means God has created a son. It's interesting. It's prophetic, meaning that the son will come. We're told in 1 Samuel that Hannah is barren. Let's take a look at 1 Samuel 1. Let's start with the first first eight verses. It says, There was a certain man from Ramathame, a Zophite from the hill country of Ephraim, whose name was Elkanah, the son of Jeroham, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zuph, an Ephraimite. He had two wives. One was called Hannah and the other Peninnah. Peninnah had children, but Hannah had none. Year after year, this man went up from his town to worship and sacrifice to the Lord Almighty at Shiloh, where Hophni and Phinehas, the two sons of Eli, were priests of the Lord. Whenever that day came for Elkanah to sacrifice, he would give portions of the meat to his wife Peninnah and to all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah, he gave a double portion because he loved her and the Lord had closed her womb. And because the Lord had closed her womb, her rival kept provoking her in order to irritate her. This went on a year after year. And whenever Hannah went up to the house of the Lord, her rival provoked her till she wept and would not eat. Elkanah, her husband, would say to her, Hannah, why are you weeping? Why don't you eat? Why are you disheartened? Don't I mean more to you than ten sons? So in the ancient world, as we read these passages about Elkanah and his two wives, Peninnah and Hannah, in the ancient world, a woman who was barren was the ultimate tragedy uh, since her husband was unable to have a son to carry on his inheritance and take over the estate and to perpetuate his name. And Elkanah most likely took this second wife, Peninnah, because Hannah was barren so that he could have children. Well, what we read is that Peninnah has become Hannah's rival. And she provokes Hannah. She thunders against her, literally, like in the Hebrew, I think it's thunders against her. Okay. And so she provokes Hannah. Hannah's And so you could just imagine Hannah's self-worth, what she feels, and the inadequacy that she senses and feels in her heart. And her adequacy is gone. Her self-worth is trampled. And what's interesting is that as you read this story, you hear shades of Sarah and Abraham, right? You know? Sarah was barren, and then God told Abraham that he was going to have 
uh, a, a, he was going to be the father of many, that millions and millions of people would come from him and there would be a massive amount of people coming from him and there would be so many descendants of Abraham that no one would be able to count them. And then he says, well, how can I do that? My wife's barren. <laughs> I can't have even one son. So Sarah said, why don't you take my handmaid, uh, Hagar, have a child with her, and that will be your son. So he does. And when Hagar becomes pregnant, she provokes Sarah. In Genesis 16, we read this. When she knew she was pregnant, she began to despise her mistress, that's Sarah. So there's similarities between Hannah and Sarah. Hannah was in distress and provoked by this woman, Peninnah. Now, as we read this, we see that Elkanah help, doesn't really help matters, okay, as we read this story. Well, Hannah was insulted by her rival. She wept and she refused to eat. And this concerned Elkanah, who wanted to eat, wanted her to eat, because he even gave her double portions. He says, here, eat. And Hannah, it looks like, was, her fav- it was his favorite wife, which caused the provoking. <laughs> So he turns to her and asks, why are you resentful? Don't I, your husband, who loves you very much, mean more to you than ten sons? Isn't that typical guy answer, by the way, the question? You have me. (laughs) You could just see that, you know. It's interesting because when he asks that question, he uses the number 10, which means completion, like the Ten Commandments. In almost a cheesy way, he's saying, don't I complete you? And she said, you had me at Hannah. No, she didn't. She didn't say that. <laughs> well, she felt incomplete, particularly in her culture and in her home because, of her, because she was barren. She became desperate. So what does she do? This woman who's desperate, who's, under, who's provoked, who's irritated, her rivals coming against her. What does she do? She goes and she prays. She's provoked enough to pray. I wonder if times when we're provoked and irritated and insulted, sometimes we have a different agenda to, than prayer. Sometimes when we're provoked and irritated, maybe we want to get back. We want to get even. We want vengeance. <laughs> vengeance is mine. <laughs> and typically, that's what happened. But Hannah did not seek to get even. She did not seek to kick this woman out. She did not seek to blame anyone. Instead, she went to God and prayed. A mother who prays is a dangerous woman to the kingdom of hell. Hannah prayed that God would hear her cry and give her son, and in return she would give him back to God. Her response when she was provoked was prayer. So let us pray. Let's look at 1 Samuel 1. Let's start with verse 9. Once when they were finished eating and drinking in Shiloh, Hannah stood up. Now Eli the priest was sitting on a chair by the doorpost of the Lord's temple. In bitterness of soul, Hannah wept much and prayed to the Lord. And she made a vow saying, O Lord Almighty, if you will only look upon your servant's misery and remember me and not forget your servant, but give her a son, then I will give him to the Lord for all the days of his life. And no razor will ever be used on his head. That's the Nazarite vow. As she kept on praying to the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. Hannah was praying in her heart and her lips were moving, but her voice was not heard. And Eli thought she was drunk and said to her, how long will you keep on getting drunk? Get rid of your wine. Not so, my Lord, Hannah replied. I'm a woman who's deeply troubled. I have not been drinking wine or beer. I was pouring out my soul to the Lord. Do not take your servant for a wicked woman. I have been praying here out of my great anguish and grief. Eli answered, go in peace and may the Lord... God, may the God of Israel grant you what you have asked of him. She said, may your servant find favor in your eyes. Then she went away and ate something, and her face was no longer downcast. Early the next morning, they arose and worshiped before the Lord, and then went back to her home at Ramah. Elkanah lay with his wife, and the Lord remembered her. So in the course of time, Hannah conceived and gave birth to a son. She named him Samuel, saying, because I asked the Lord for him. Samuel, I think, is the ask of the Lord. Is similar to that word. So she prayed and God heard her prayer. Through the tragedy of her barrenness comes a man of God. God usually turns tragedy from impossible to beauty to grace and goodness. Her son is Samuel, both prophet and judge of Israel. A very important man in the history of Israel. His mother gave him to God when he was five years old. She says, I will give him back to you. And that's what she does. She gives him back to God. 
And so she takes him home, or or she she gives birth, she weans him, and then at five years old, she takes him back to Shiloh to the priest, and he says, he's staying here with you, and he's going to grow up here because I'm giving him back to God. And every year she would come back, she would give him a present, she would think of him, and she would pray. And, you know, Samuel's influence is far-reaching because he had a mother who prayed. She reminds me of another woman who prayed. You know, this woman, she was the 25th child in a dissenter's family. A dissenter in England at this time was someone that was not part of the Church of England. Though brilliant, she procured little education. Though strong will, she lived in a male-dominated age. She married an older man and, and bore 19 children. Nine of them died. Her house burned up, her barn fell down, her health fell, and she lived with the wolf at the door. She was Susanna Wesley. Samuel and Susanna Wesley married in 1689, pastoring a dreary little Ep- church in Epworth in 1697. They served there 40 years and during hardships. For example, Samuel's salary was so small and incapable of managing it, he was thrown into debtor's prison, leaving Susanna to fend for herself. The two were strong-willed and argumentative. Samuel once prayed for the king and waited for Susanna's amen. And she wouldn't give it. And he says, what's up? Well, I don't believe the Prince of Orange to be the king. Then you and I must part, replied Samuel, for if we have two kings, we must have two beds. And they separated and became united only after the king's death. They also disagreed about Susanna's ministry, for her Bible lessons drew more listeners than his sermons. Her brother, having promised (coughs) her a sizable gift, disappeared mysteriously, and she was never heard from again. He says, I'm going to give you this big gift, and where did he go? Finally, on July 21st, 1731, Susanna described an accident in which her horses stampeded, throwing Samuel from the wagon and injured himself so that he was never well from that day on. A most difficult life, and yet the parsonage of Epworth was destined to become the most celebrated in English history, for, for from it came two of the greatest evangelists of all time, John and Charles Wesley. Charles Wesley is known for his amazing hymns that he wrote. John Wesley, of course, for literally saving England from civil war and the revolution that had happened in France. And the mother who raised them shook the world. The beauty of God's grace was truly revealed in Ma. Number two, a mother obeys and remembers. Let's go to Luke chapter one. I think of another mom in Scripture. I think of Mary, the mother of Jesus. In Luke 1, Mary's a young girl, a teenager, engaged to be married to a man named Joseph. She's Jewish, living in a forgotten town, marginalized, neglected. Her husband did not have much of a promising career, even though carpentry is a great career today. Back then, it may not so much have been, simply because he didn't have land. And if you don't have land, you don't have wealth. It was just subject to whatever he could find. And I imagine the tax collectors would make families destitute. Time for the tax. And she's then visited by an angel, the angel Gabriel. Of course, this is read oftentimes at Christmas. Let's go to Luke chapter 1, verse 26. In the sixth month, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will be with child and give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus. He will be great and be called the the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end kingdom will never end. Mary did not expect much drama in her life. You know, I imagine she could probably see how her life would turn out. 
And we really don't, and if you think of it, do we know the name of the lady that lived next door to Mary? Do we know the people that lived across the street or down the street? But we know her name, and we know Joseph's name. Well, Gabriel visits Mary, and the greeting perplexes her. He says, greetings, highly favored one. Highly favored? I'm not highly favored. Then she's told that she's going to be the mother of the Messiah. The anointed, the one, the one everyone was waiting for. This would be God's son, God's ruler, God's king. He's going to reign. And she's be, she has been called to be the mother of God's son, the Messiah. Now, maybe she didn't grasp all that was being asked of her. Maybe the enormity of the calling may not have hit home, but it was her calling. She was young, she was naive, and she was probably confused. First, you call me highly favored, and then I will be having a child, but I'm not married, and I'm a virgin. How's this going to be? And then Gabriel reveals to Mary that this child is no ordinary child. This is God's son. He will be conceived in a way that is so unique that it will never be seen or heard of again. The Holy Spirit will do it. And this child will be called the Son of God. And as she's listening to this, as she's hearing this, this calling and all of its overwhelming presence. I'm the, going to be the mother of this child, your son, as she's listening. She does not argue with the angel. That's what's interesting. She doesn't argue with the angel. She, it's not like Moses. Remember Moses when God says, you're going to be the leader. He says, well, I can't speak. And, you know, I can't do this. Lord, no one's going to listen to me. And then, and then she says the best. And then he says, oh, Lord, please send someone else to do it. That was Moses. <laughs> Will you please send someone else to do it? Mary doesn't do any of that. You don't see her saying, pick someone else, God. I'm too young. I'm not smart enough. I'm not strong enough. I'm not even old enough to be the mother of your son. She never complained. Instead, look at what it says in verse 38. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May it be to me as you have said. Then the angel left her. I am the Lord's servant. She didn't complain. She didn't argue. She simply said, I am the Lord's servant. She listened and obeyed. The heartache and struggle that she would face as a result of this child, she did not foresee. Could you imagine if she said, you're, if the angel said to her, you're going to be the, the mother of, my, of God's son. Well, that's great, but I have a few things then that I'm going to need. She didn't do any of that either, right? She just listened and she obeyed the calling. She said, I am the Lord's servant. A mom is a servant. A mom is a calling, particularly the Lord's servant. The high calling of mom is found in the calling that Mary heard. To raise your child is to be the Lord's servant. The beauty of God's grace is truly revealed in mom. And I guarantee you, she did not see the pain that she would face as being the mother of this child. In fact, it's interesting if you look at 2 verse 35, when Simeon is talking to her, in 2 verse 35, it says, So that the thoughts of many hearts will re- be revealed. And then it's like he turns to Mary and says this, And a sword will pierce your own soul too. When Mary gave birth, she placed Jesus in a manger wrapped in, in rags. And there was no glamour in the calling. And moms know what I mean. There was no wealth in this calling. There was no special circumstances. And when the shepherds arise, she's perplexed. If you take a look at chapter 2, again, verse 16, when the the shepherds hear about Jesus, it says in verse 16, so they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. Did you catch that? You know what you put in a treasure is something that you hold near and dear, something that you open up and you look at again. And it's special to you. It's important to you. You open it up and say, this is my gift that God has given me. And she then gave it to her son, the Lord Jesus. She heard this. It became a treasure to her. And then she gave it back to Jesus. The grace of God 
is truly revealed in her. Number three, a mother teaches. A mother teaches. You know, when Nicholas was eight or nine, Kathy, his mom, went to the pastor and asked if the elders of the church would anoint and pray for Nicholas in keeping with James chapter 5. And Kathy says she wasn't thinking that God might heal all Nicholas's disabilities. She might simply felt that God wanted the elders to pray for her son, Nicholas. And she didn't know why. So one Sunday she brought him to church in a wheelchair. And after the service, they went to the office and the elders and the pastor, they prayed for this boy. Well, when Kathy called the pastor several years later that night, all those years, he was now, Nicholas was now 25 years old, 16 years later. And every week for 25 years, Kathy had visited him. In all those visits, Nicholas never communicated with her except laughing sometimes as she entered the room. And it seemed that nothing had ever changed. Well, Kathy had just had her annual consultation with a team of professionals who care for Nicholas. In the course of that meeting, the speech therapist said, I think Nicholas is making some progress. We've been using these green and red cards for yes and no. And he's learning to point to the right card in answer to some of the questions. Would you like to see? And she was overjoyed. Yes, I would love to. And so she's nervous as she's going to Nicholas's room. And the therapist held up the green card and red cards and asked, Nicholas, is your mom with us today? And Nicholas pointed to the green card. And Kathy could hardly believe it. Other questions convinced that he said, yes, this was not an accident. He really understood. And she called the pastor in tears, telling him her good news. All those years I'd visit him, and I never knew if he even knew who I was. And now I know. He knows I'm his mother, and he's excited to see me. I imagine she treasured it in her heart. A son that she couldn't communicate with finally acknowledged, this is my mom. And she treasured it in her heart. This mother reminds me of the woman who sought out Jesus in Mark 7 because her daughter was demonized. And regardless of what Jesus said, she was persistent and enduring. And Christ answered her prayer, says, help my daughter. And Jesus did. You think of that mother in Mark 7 who was persistent and enduring and would not give up. A mother's concerned. And, you know, a mother is concerned with you knowing the truth. You know, when I think of um, Timothy in in the book of Acts, Timothy lived in the eastern part of what is now modern-day Turkey. He lived in an area or a town called Lystra. And Paul was traveling through the region, visiting the churches he planted, strengthening them, encouraging them. And then he was going to move on and plant some more. When he came to Lystra, though, he heard of a young man named Timothy. And he really stood out because he got the attention of Paul. And Paul took him in and says, you're going to come with us and we're going to go plant churches. So in Acts 16, it should be on the screen, it says this. He came to Derby and then to Lystra, where a disciple named Timothy lived, whose mother was a Jewish, Jewess and a believer, but whose father was a Greek. The brothers at Lystra and Iconium. him spoke well of him. Paul wanted to take him along on the journey, so he circumcised him because of the Jews who had lived in that area, for they all knew that his father was a Greek. As they traveled from town to town, they delivered the decisions reached by the apostles and elders in Jerusalem for the people to obey. So the churches were strengthened in the faith and grew daily in numbers. So you see that this young man, Timothy, really stood out to the point that caught Paul's attention. says, you're going to come with us. His mother was a Jewess and a follower of Christ. And because of, t- of her, Timothy was a disciple of Christ. Her influence made Timothy and his character stand out because his mother has devoted herself to him, invested in him. In fact, in 2 Timothy 1, it says this, I have been reminded of your sincere faith which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and I'm persuaded now lives in you also. The deep faith of his grandmother and mother were so rich that it spilled into Timothy. He was the man he was because his mother had invested in him. She taught him Christ. And when Paul comes to the end of his life, Timothy is very important to him. He calls him my true son in the faith. 
Paul is in jail waiting his trial to be heard by the Caesar. And as he waits, limited by his chains, he says, uh, he writes to him two letters to Timothy telling him what he must do. And Timothy is the pastor of the church in Ephesus, this very large church. And Paul was the pastor before him. So you can imagine the big shoes he had to fill. He was young. He was nervous. He's probably naive. So Paul tells him in First Timothy, Timothy, my son, I give you this instruction in keeping with the prophecies once made about you so that by following them, you might fight the good fight. He told Timothy to not let anyone look down on his youth, but to set an example for the believers in speech, in life, in love, in faith, in purity. He told him to watch his life and doctrine closely. Persevere in them, because if you do, you will save both yourself and your hearers. He he has a very important role as teacher, pastor, and leader of this Ephesian church. It had influence throughout the region. And Timothy was the pastor. And it was his mother and grandmother that influenced him the most, that prayed for him. Now reflect on your own mother today. Some of you may have had bad experiences with your mom. Some of you had great mothers. Some moms struggle, some moms don't. But we all have had a mom or still do. But I believe God is saying to you today, I want you to thank me for your mom. Good or bad. In all the humanness that mom has, in all the sin that she had and the hurt she felt, behind that is the grace pouring out. And I want you to see it. Remember the beauty of God's grace is revealed in mom. Let's pray. Father, thank you for mom. Thank you for these moms that we looked at here in Scripture. Thank you for the the beauty of your word. And Lord, I just pray that we will learn to say thank you, even in the most difficult situations or the easiest of times. Let us celebrate your great name.